Welcome back, dear students. Uh, have you studied the material in the first presentation, the characteristics and categories of major investment alternatives? Good, because in this presentation, we're going to get a little closer now. We're going to do a little thumbnail, as they often say, version of the major investment alternatives. We call this the overview of the investment universe. And as we go through this, we want you to make sure that you understand what is in the presentation. Do not worry about all the other things you've heard on television or on the infernal net or your brother-in-law, Mr. Know-it-all, fabulous, fantastic investor, tells you. All you have to understand is what is on these slides. That is it. <laughs> and if you do have a question, you know who to come to, right? Again, I can talk about this stuff a whole lot longer than most people would ever want to listen. So let us start on slide number 15, measuring investment return. Well, return is actually fairly straightforward to measure, right? What did you start with? What did you end with? There are two returns, and we will discuss them, but more importantly, we're going to concentrate on the second one because that allows us to compare our returns with other types of investments. There's the total dollar return, the return on an investment measured in dollars that accounts for all the cash flows in and out and the capital gains or losses. But more importantly is the total percentage return. That's the return on an investment measured as a percentage that accounts for all the cash flows, cash inflows, outflows, capital gains, and losses, because that allows us to compare alternatives. Some investments are more income-oriented, cash flows, and some are more capital gains or growth-oriented. Yeah. Slide number 16. Measuring investment risk. Hmm. Whereas return was pretty easy to measure, risk is a whole lot more difficult to measure. In fact, it's imperfect. It's impossible. All the measures that we use are not good. <laughs> the one that we use the most is standard deviation. Huh? Well, relax. We'll investigate this in our next presentation in detail. But standard deviation measures the volatility of an investment. And it for, comes from math and st statistics. I'm sorry, statistics. And don't worry, you're not going to have to do any standard deviation calculations. They're all done for us. All we have to do is look them up. But standard deviation measures the volatility of an investment. Because in any given year, there is about a two-thirds chance that the return on an investment will be within one standard deviation of the historical average return. Uh, later, later. We'll discuss it later. We'll show it to you later. But in other words, we say we're going to get 4% or 8%. But... In any one year, not necessarily. We could get 5, 6, minus 3, minus, uh, plus 2. You, you, it, there's a, a variance involved, a deviation. And in general, the higher the standard deviation, the more volatile the investment, the greater the variance from the normal return. And as I said, we're going to investigate this in detail in our next presentation. So you see what we're up against? Return is very straightforward to measure. Risk is a whole lot more difficult. And as we go through these um, next several slides regarding the major investment alternatives, we will discuss their return and their risk. So always keep these in mind. Slide 17. Here's the overview, folks. Equities. It's a great name, isn't it? Most people call them stocks. The real name is common stocks. In fixed income securities. That's the fancy word for bonds or loans. Short-term investments, also known as cash, although it's not really cash. It's pretty darn close. 
Mutual funds, investment companies that invest for us. These first four are the ones we're going to concentrate on for almost the entire semester. Hybrid securities, well, first of all, hybrid. Is that a, like a car, like gasoline and electric? Yeah, it's similar. The idea is there's a mixture. There's a mixture of equities and fixed income securities. We'll spend a very small amount of time on these. And to be truthful, folks, they're a very small part of the investment universe. And then the others, real estate, commodities, uh, uh, collectibles, art, precious metals. Again, we'll spend a small amount of time. For, for the vast majority of us, these are not that important. And then the last one, derivatives. These things are dangerous, toxic, caca, poo, poo, stay away from them. Although you'll hear other people say, no, you don't understand. It's like going to Las Vegas. Well, if you enjoy gambling, you're probably going to enjoy derivatives. But they have no place in the prudent, long-term oriented investors' uh, portfolio. In my humble opinion, remember, everyone's different. That's why there's chocolate and vanilla and some people like strawberry. So now let's look at each in more detail. Slide number 18. Equity securities, stocks, common stocks. Again, we're going to spend a plurality of time on stocks. Why? Because that's where the action is. Especially for younger investors, you want to get involved in stocks. Now, whether you choose your own or someone else chooses them for you, we'll discuss that later on. But the idea is that you are part owner in corporations. That's what stocks are. And the term comes from... Uh, 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 name many years ago, common stocks. They were shareholders in common. We'll discuss that later on when, when we concentrate on, on stocks. But there are two wonderful things that we, reserve, we receive, I'm sorry, from uh, stocks. Dividends, which are optional payments to shareholders, and capital gains, where the company does well and the shares increase in value. Now, are either of these guaranteed? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. A third benefit that we gain that people don't often think about is the limited liability. If you've taken Business 120, you understand the difference between a corporation and a partnership and a sole proprietorship. Well, with a partnership or a sole proprietorship, you're on the hook. It doesn't matter how many debts the business creates, they're going to come after you. But with a corporation, the idea is that these investors who are passive investors, you know, sitting back and letting the corporation do its job, should not be held liable for major screw-ups that the corporation incurs. Now, are there times when people uh, try to use the corporation as a veil to hide their debts? Yes, and that's why sometimes the courts can pierce the corporate veil. You might have heard that phrase. But with the companies that we're going to look at, large companies that are bona fide, which is a fancy word for saying they're actual, you know, the real companies. They're not shams. They're not scams. That's not going to be an issue. Now, some invest, some stocks are moderate risk, but for the most part, in my humble opinion, stocks should be considered high risk. Some are speculative. And what you will hear is stocks are volatile. Right. Well, you know what that means? I lost a lot of money. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's the euphemism. You know what a euphemism is when you say, we're going to go to the little boy's room, we're going to go to the TT room or whatever, instead of saying we're going to go to the bathroom. Well, euphemism is a, is a term that means something else. So when you hear someone say to their friend, how was that stock you bought? And he or she says, oh, yeah, it's been very volatile. That means they bought it for $11.88 and sold it for $0.30. Cents. <laughs> Do you know anybody who's bought a stock for $11.88 and sold it for $0.30? Cents? I do. I, I've known him all my life. He's kind of goofy. He teaches investments at Southwood. You know, it was a great company, folks. It was a phenomenal company that, that was making one of the most exciting new tech. Yeah, well, I'm going to do my best to show you that those companies can be identified 
and they can make you a whole lot of money, and they can lose you a whole lot of money. So whether or not you invest is your decision, but you'll be going into the proposition with your eyes wide open. I knew this company was extremely dangerous, and they could have, you know, they could have turned the thousand dollars into fifty thousand or fifty cents, which is a little bit. They did a little bit more than fifty cents. <laughs> so remember that stocks are volatile. You can lose a lot of money, but they historically been the best investments over time. I normally tell people 8 to 10 percent. 8 to, whoops, oops, oops, is this right? yeah, 8 to 10 percent. But actually some have done a lot better. Some have done a lot worse. But they've actually done 8 to 12. Stocks, in my humble opinion, should always be considered a long-term investment, dear students. So our 2008 definition, hmm, let's see. Stocks are equity investment instruments designed to lose value. Yeah, 2008 was a rough year, folks. And uh, we survived. We're still standing. You never know. There's lots of people who are saying it's going to come back. And you're yeah, right. Eventually, something like that will happen again. We don't know when. History tells us that capitalism is just a series of cycles. Most good, some bad, some really bad. Slide number 19. Fixed income securities, bonds, or just times, sometimes just called fixed, fixed investment. Bonds are loans. They are long-term loans to corporations, corporate bonds, state and local governments, municipal bonds, and the treasury, treasury bonds, federal government bonds, government bonds, governments, treasuries. You see, when you're a major corporation, a large corporation, or you're a state, or a local government, or you're this community college, Southwestern Community College, you don't go to a bank. You go to the investment community and you say, hey, will you lend us money? We'll pay you 4% or 6% or maybe even 8%. And the investment community takes a good hard look at you, rates your credit, and says, yeah, sure, we'll do it. And so you promise to pay the bond holders, the bond investors, interest and the principal, just like when you go to a bank. But now you're the bank. Does that make sense? I hope so. Because banks, you know, we tend to think of lend, uh, loans as liabilities. Well, for us, they are. But for the banks, they're, they're, they're the assets. They're, they're, they are their, <laughs> English, they are their uh, investments. They are their assets. And so you can be like the bank. That's what bond investors are. Bond investors receive the uh, interest, the promise of the loan to be repaid, and historically have been much, much less riskier than stocks. Now, don't get me wrong, they go up and down, sometimes go down quite a bit, very rarely, but it happens. But over the long term, what can we reasonably expect to get? Well, I have a definition here, a number here, numbers here, that are basically what they've done throughout uh, anywhere from 1940s all the way up to the, about 2000 or so, 2000, into the 2000s. But the last 18 years or so, 20 years or so, they've actually paid a lot less. Bonds are now paying 3 4%, 5% if you're lucky, folks. Whereas the long-term average over those many decades was about 4 to 5 or 6% for, for federal and muni bonds and six, seven, eight percent, kind of like a like a mortgage for corporations. And what are mortgages paying now? Four uh, percent, right? And that's what bonds are paying, four percent. So right now, bonds are on the low side. But they've been inching up, and we'll see over the next several years, we should see them come back. Please, 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 because that means the economy is stronger. And yeah, there's more demand for money, and investors are going to get paid more, yippee, yippee, yippee. But right now, they're paying on the low end of those numbers. Let's see. They're good intermediate term and long term investments. There's a way for bonds to be short term. We'll discuss that later on. But you, you think of bonds as intermediate to long term. Now, let's take a look at the 2008 definition. Bonds are fixed rate investment instruments designed to lose value. Yes, indeed, in, t in 2008. Yes, you had to go back to 1994 to see bonds lose in value. Uh, but you go to 2008 and they lost big time. Not treasuries, but everybody else. Why? Because people were so frightened that the world was going to end. 
They sold their bonds and the price dropped. Huh? We'll discuss that later on. How the price of bonds goes up and down. But yeah, bonds took it on the chin in 2008. Slide number 20. Short-term investments. Short-term vehicles. Short-term instruments. Cash. These are uh, tradable securities that are designed to, you know, park your money. But, you know, say, put your money in a safe place for a year or so. Remember, short term, right? What's short term? Well, most people in the industry use a year or so. I use up to two or maybe even three years, depending on how important the money is. It's usually guaranteed or pretty darn close, and it's extremely liquid. Many of them let you write a check, such as money markets. There's a very low risk of losing your principal. In fact, it's negligible. Usually, it's either guaranteed or, as we said, pretty darn close. But what are we going to get? Exactly. Um, low reward. 2 to 5% over time. But now, they're normally paying less than 1%. Some are paying a little more than 1%, but... Your savings account at the bank sure ain't paying 1%. We call this a place to park your money. And we'll also throw in a slide from Business 121, Financial Planning and Money Management, about an emergency fund. Put, this, put the money for your emergencies in short-term instruments, short-term investments. Now let's see the 2008 definition. Short-term investments are instruments designed to accept what remains of investors' money after they've given up on stocks and bonds, right? <laughs> after they sold everything they had in 2008, where did it go? In a money market, in a savings account, yeah. yeah bad idea. Well, they did it. They did it. That was their decision. Slide number 21. Here are just some examples that we will discuss in our final presentation of this chapter 1. Uh, 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 like this chapter one, we'll discuss these in detail. So here are all the different short-term investments. Um, most of these are available to us. The last two, corporate paper, bankers' acceptance notes, no, nah, not normally because they come in large denominations. So we'll come back to these guys in our final presentation for chapter one, okay? So put that on hold. Slide 32, I'm sorry, 22, <laughs> slide 22. Uh, mutual funds. Yay, mutual funds. Mutual funds will bore us to wealth. Uh, the legal term is investment company. And I understand where the term mutual fund comes from, but I really like the legal term better, investment company. You want shoes, you go to a shoe company. You want a car, you go to a car company. You want insurance, you go to an insurance company. You want investments, you go to an investment company. Don't go to an insurance company for investments. You'll be very, very sad. This is a company that pools investors' money and invests in a diversified portfolio of securities. They're going to do the investing for you. And investors get two wonderful things. Diversification, because the mutual fund can purchase hundreds of securities. You know, for an individual investor to, to buy 10 or 20 stocks or bonds, it's not easy to do all that research, folks, and you have to keep track of these. And the mutual fund does that for you. But they don't just invest in 10 companies. They invest in 100 or 20 or 120 or 200. And as we've already uh, alluded to, you're getting professional money management. These people are paid very well and often do a very good job. And sometimes they don't do a very good job. But <clears throat> that's true of any industry, isn't it? There are good professors and not so good professors. There are good doctors and not so good doctors, and there are good uh, janitors and mechanics and plumbers. And so we, if as the mutual fund investors, want to do our research and make sure we buy high quality mutual funds with very, very capable and long term oriented professional money management. They are extremely popular, as we will see, and range from very low risk, almost guaranteed, to very high risk, speculative risk. We will discuss mutual funds in our next chapter. After we introduce investments and the, the history of risk versus return, we will then dive into mutual funds. Why? Because 
it's very likely, dear students, that as a, an employee at a company, you're going to be offered a, an employee-sponsored plan, a retirement plan, such as a 401k or the like, and the vast majority of these use mutual funds for their investments. So it's very important for you to understand them. Now let's see, what's the 2008 definition? Uh, yeah, them too. <laughs> right? Of course, well, the mutual funds invest in the stocks, they invest in the bonds, and the stocks and the bonds went down, so the mutual funds went down. Now here's a graphic that I made myself. Are you proud of me? I'm really not very artistic. I'm really not very artistic. My brother got those genes in our family. I'm good at making stick figures. You like them? You like them? Here they are. Here they are. Here we are, folks. We're the little people, <laughs> and those are women, believe it or not. And we give our money, $50, $100 a month, more if we can afford it, to the, whoops, to the mutual fund managers. These are the people with the top hats, and more and more of them are women. Why? Because it turns out women make better investors. Hmm, we'll talk about that later. And then what they do is they create a pool of money. Now, I know it kind of looks like a potato. I'm sorry. But it's supposed to be a pond or a pool or whatever. And so there are millions of these people giving billions of dollars to these managers. So these pools are very large. These mutual funds. Again, I like investment company better. So what they do is they go out and buy stocks. It's called a stock mutual fund. They go out and buy bonds. That's called a bond mutual fund. Isn't it tricky how this works? If they go out and buy the cash short-term instruments that we've been discussing, then we call it a money market mutual fund. But usually the mutual fund disappears and people just call it a money market. And if they buy a combination of stocks and bonds, hmm, that's a balance fund. And we will discuss all these and many more types of mutual funds in our second uh, chapter after, our first, after the first chapter. So <clears throat> does it make sense now what's going on? They don't buy 10 stocks or 10 bonds. They buy 150. So if one company goes belly up, yes, your portfolio doesn't suffer tremendously. Approximately 50% of American households own mutual funds or used to. That's dipped, actually, since the Great Recession. But it's coming back up again because mm, it's very likely that you're going to have one of these as in your employer-sponsored plan or your own IRA or Roth IRA. Slide number 24, hybrid investments. Well, for now, folks, all you have to understand is that third bullet there. Hybrid investments are designed to offer the stability of fixed income bonds, fixed income investments, bonds, and the opportunity for capital growth of equity investment stocks. So in other words, the idea is we're going to give you a, a, the best of both worlds. But you know what happens when you get the best of both worlds? Right, you get the worst of both worlds. So they have the advantages of stocks and bonds, and they have the disadvantages of stocks and bonds. Two of the major types of, um, of hybrid securities are preferred stocks and convertible preferred and convertible bonds, convertible securities. So they sound kind of exciting. Oh, don't you want preferred stocks as opposed to just regular common stocks? Well, it turns out, no, you don't. You don't really want preferred stocks. Some people will. Some people will gravitate to them. But there are tax considerations that make them more popular with corporations than with individuals. And convertibles, well, now there's something sexy, right? You want a convertible car? You want a convertible bond or a convertible preferred stock? Eh, not really. No. <laughs> Again, some people will gravitate, will become enticed, and use these as their port use these as as uh, options in their portfolio. But for the vast majority of us, no. You want bonds? Go buy bonds. You want income? Go buy bonds. You want stability? Go buy bonds. You want stocks? You want growth? Go buy stocks. You want dividends? Go buy st stocks. Okay. And we'll discuss these. In brief, much later on, also, as we've already mentioned, they are a tiny part of the investment universe. They are small compared to stocks and bonds and mutual funds. So they're a little bit of the uh, backwater. And again, some people will make them uh, an important part of their investing uh, portfolio and career, and most of us will just basically ignore them. Now, 
<clears throat> other popular investment in vehicles, which may be to your liking, especially real estate. Real estate, folks, I like to say real estate is tricky, which is a, a, another one of those euphemisms. Uh, it's a pain in the... Mm, and I have a renewed appreciation for stocks, bonds, mutual funds after becoming a real estate investor, although it's been very profitable. So residential, commercial, raw land, real estate investment trusts, what are those? Just later, later, later. It's like a mutual fund that's made up of real estate. If you can stick, stick with us, we'll, we'll get through it. And it, we'll spend some time on real estate at the very end. But as we said before, real estate is an entire course in itself. And the classes that we teach in real estate are really not that important for us. What's more important? Get out there in the industry and learn what the hell's going on. In my humble opinion, before you chunk down $100,000 and buy your first property, <laughs> I'm talking rental property. I'm not talking, your, I'm not talking about your home. I'm talking about a, an investment property because they want 25% as a down pay, payment, not 5 or 10% is to go out to the industry and work in a property management firm. Literally, I'm serious. I'm serious. And if you don't want to work there, uh, volunteer. Uh, do job shadowing. Because that's when you really understand what is all involved and uh, what kind of pains that you're going to exhibit. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk about that later on. Now, these others... Tangible assets, precious metals, jewels, arts, collectibles, tax advantage instruments. You know, we'll spend a tiny bit of time on these folks, but they're, for the vast majority of us, no, they're not that important. And you're probably thinking, but I want to learn all about gold. Uh, hang on a minute. I'll show you how well gold has done over the last 200 years uh, compared to stocks and bonds. Yeah, you don't. Unless you believe the world is going to end, in which case, get out of the northern hemisphere Go down to Tierra del Fuego and learn to raise, raise goats because you don't want to be in the, if you're one of those people who believes the whole darn thing is going to collapse and fall into a pool of tears, you do not want to be in the Northern Hemisphere when it happens. I don't care how much ammunition you, ammunition you have, how many guns and cans of, of spam you've got stored away. It ain't going to help you when 100 million people are looking for food. It just isn't going to help you. You can't shoot that many people. As we said, there'll be a little bit of time at the end of the semester, and we'll discuss these in, uh, in, you know, in, a, in a short period of time. If you have questions, certainly don't feel free to ask. If I don't know the answer, you know what I'll say? I don't know. Let's go find out. Let's go find somebody who is an expert in those areas. And by the way, none of these were spared in 2008. In fact, the real estate investors were hit the hardest. People would ask me in 2008, well, are, are you really upset about your stocks going down 40% or so? I said, well, I'm not happy about it. You know, I don't think the world is going to end, but it, who knows? It might. It was looking pretty bad there for a while. But I really felt bad for the real estate investors who were wiped out, folks. They lost every dime and then $100,000, $200,000 or more of borrowed money which is why the banks had to be bailed out because these people never paid that money back. They just walked away from their investment. That's how bad it was, folks. We were looking at the abyss. And um, our, our uh, Federal Reserve Bank and partly the Congress, too, helped. Uh, and the fact that we're such a resilient uh, economy, the United States innovative and resilient and resourceful economy, we got through that. We got through. Now there are people saying, no, we just postponed it. I tend to disagree. I don't think we postponed it. I just think we've set the stage for another one. And I don't know when that's going to happen. <laughs> but I don't know what's going to be. It's probably not going to be real estate. Who knows? You don't know. You could be cryptocurrencies. It could be whatever. Uh, uh, cyborgs or, or DNA um, uh, transplants. We don't know what it's going to be. But the next bubble is going to happen. And when it does, hopefully it won't be as bad as that real estate bubble. And before that was the internet bubble, and that wasn't anywhere near as bad as the real estate bubble. So, you know, capitalism ain't perfect, folks. Be ready. Think long term. Now, I digress. Let's go to slide 26 and discuss our favorite, I'm joking here, folks, favorite <laughs> investment alternative, and those are derivatives. Now, as we said, Many in the financial world, myself included, do not characterize these as investments. They are speculations. 
which is a fancy word for gambling. Whenever you hear us use the term speculation in this class, you can insert the word gambling. You can replace it with gambling. Speculative securities, derivative assets. Let's start at the top here. Derivative assets are speculative securities that derive their value from an underlying asset or sec what you mean they're not the actual right right they're pointing to something else and saying i am getting my value from that stock over there or i am getting my value from that bond over there and how does that work don't worry about it bobby sit down relax all you have to know is memorize that one line they derive their value from something else. And remember that the two biggest, although there are many more, the two biggest um, examples are options and futures. Don't worry about calls and puts and contracts and commodities and stock indices. We'll discuss those later on. But options and futures are the two big examples of derivatives and they derive their value from some other underlying security or asset. And what do we know? They are dangerous. They are deadly. They, um, uh, Mr. Warren Buffett, one of the world's greatest investors, calls them weapons of mass financial destruction, right? Have you heard of weapons of mass destruction? Weapons of mass financial destruction. Of course, he was right. And so let's take a look at what they were like in 2008. The derivative speculators did not feel so all, all alone in 2008. Usually, they're the only ones who are proud to have only lost 30%. Hey, I only lost 30% last year. I'm done pretty darn well in derivatives. I let, the year before that, I lost everything. It's gambling, folks. Stay away. It's gambling. You might, you, who knows? You might win. You might also win at Vegas. You won't. It's not going to happen. Slide number 27. So what are our emphases in this course? What are we going to emphasize? Well, here are the four big ones, folks. We're going to spend a whole lot of time on stocks where you are an owner. And if you have a long-term perspective, that's where you want to be. We will spend some time on bonds where you are loaning your money. And some people just don't like to, They think stocks are too darn scary. I hope to convince them no. Because if the world does end and all your stocks become worth zero, assuming you're buying high quality stocks, then it doesn't matter where your money is because all the bonds are going to go and all the, the, the banks are going to fail and all the, the hospitals are going to be shuttered and the schools and the, and the fire departments and the, and, the, and the police departments and the, there's no food at the Vons and there's no gas at the Chevron station, no clothes at the Gap and the cell phones aren't working and the sewers are backed up and, and SDG&E is not pumping out. Yeah, 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 it could, it could happen. I don't think it will, and failure is not an option. Get out there, put on your pants, get to work, and make sure it doesn't happen. We will also spend a little bit of time on cash, uh, short-term securities. Why? Because there's, there's not much to really learn about these things. They're pretty darn straightforward, and we will stuff them into this chapter. Okay? Get them out of the way. And then we'll spend a good deal of time on mutual funds. Why? Because as we've already said, very important choices. Very important uh, asset class for most of us who work at a company that has an employer-sponsored uh, retirement plan. For the vast majority of investors, these are the most popular and most important financial investment options. Now, if you are gung-ho about learning all about real, real estate, contact me and I'll give you whatever I can and then point you in the direction of people who can help you uh, get an internship or the like, or just you know job shadow or the like, because real estate is a very very important investment alternative. But it's just it's a it's it's a pain in the patootie, folks. It's not easy. So here are the major emphases in our course. Cool? Are you ready? Excited? I hope so. As I said, I can talk about this a whole lot longer than most anybody reasonable person, any reasonable person would ever want to listen. And hopefully I'll make you a non-reasonable person and you'll be excited to hear all about these. Huh? That's going to do, that's my goal. My goal is to get you excited about investments. Slide number 28. So now in the face-to-face -face class, folks, we have these ABCD cards. 
because we don't have a whole lot of money at Southwestern. At SDSU, San Diego State, they have these little buttons next to the to the uh, chairs, and the students press A, B, C, or D, and it lights up on the screen how many people picked A, how many people picked We don't have that kind of money. But So it's a, it's a way to check for comprehension. And if you've printed them out, you already know the answers. If you printed out the slides before you're listening to this or watching this, you already know the answers, so I apologize. But what are investment companies that pool investors' money and invest in a diversified portfolio of securities? Huh? Investors get two wonderful things, diversification and professional money management. Right, you know what they are. Right, those are mutual funds. The investment company is the legal term. But you're not going to hear that unless you work in the industry. Mutual fund is the popular term. That's what you're going to hear. So you pool your money with other investors. You get a diversified portfolio of stocks, bonds, whatever. And, uh, and hopefully your professional money managers are good at what they do. And they will make you wealthy. They will bore you to wealth. <laughs> I like that term. Slide 29. What are investments that represent ownership in a corporation? Hmm? Ownership. Investors receive dividends and capital gains or capital losses. What are these? Equity, right? Your ownership. You know what they are. Those are common stocks. And when people use the term stocks, they are almost virtually talking. They're almost always talking about common stocks. If they say preferred stocks, then they're talking about preferred. And again, I know common doesn't sound that exciting. Ugh, I don't want just all India common. Yes, you do. You want common stocks or just stocks. <laughs> uh, slide number 30. What are investments with very little risk and correspondingly very little return? This is often used as a place to park your money or for an emergency fund of three to six months of income. What would you write? Short term. Little risk, little return. Low risk, low return. A place to park your money for uh, three, six, nine months, a year or so, maybe even two years, depending how important it is. But if you don't need the money soon, you need to find some better alternatives that will, that will pay you better over time. In my humble opinion, it's your money. Slide number 31. What are fixed income securities, fixed investments that represent loans to corporations, municipalities, state and local governments and agencies, and the federal government, treasuries? Investors receive interest and a promise to repay the loan. What are these? Right, bonds. Bonds are fixed income investments, fixed. And bonds are far less volatile than stocks, although they do go up and down. They fluctuate. Huh? We'll discuss that later on. But if we're looking for stability, what do we want? Bonds. And then slide 32. What are securities designed to offer the stability of fixed income investments with the opportunity for capital growth of equity investments? And examples include preferred stock and convertible bonds and convertible preferred stock. What are these? Yes, mixture, uh, a, a, a combination. These are hybrid securities. They give us the advantages of stocks and bonds and the disadvantages of stocks and bonds. And they are, as we said, a small part of the investment universe. So yeah, most of us will never really get involved with these things. And then lastly, what are speculative securities that derive their value from an underlying security or asset? The examples include options, options contracts to be precise, but most people just say options, and futures contracts. Again, most people just say futures. That's enough to make it crazy, right? Try saying options contracts three times fast. What are these things? Derivatives. They derive their value from another asset, another security. Huh? Later, later, later. That's all you have to know about them. But what you mostly have to know about them is that they are dangerous. You can make a lot of money and then you can lose a lot of money. More likely, you're going to lose a lot of money. Why? Because as Mr. Buffett says, investing is simple, but it ain't easy. And what does he mean? He means once your emotions get involved, it becomes very difficult, especially if you're speculating, gambling in such 
dangerous things as derivatives. So now, what I hope you've seen is that this stuff isn't that hard, folks. It really isn't that hard on the surface. We will later on pull back uh, like an onion and pull away the layers and learn more and more and deeper and deeper until we get to the core of the course. But for now, this is all you have to know. And for one last uh, little uh, exercise here, slide number 34, what are reasonable long-term expectations of returns from the following investments? Long-term, in any one year, you don't know what you're going to get. But stocks, right. The history tells us 8 to 12, but I try to tell people 8 to 9, 8, 9, 10 percent, right? I'm going to get their expectations too high. How about bonds? 4 to 8? Well, nowadays it's better to say 3 to 6. But they'll come back. They'll, I think so. I, I'm not sure. You, know, you never know. It's the future. Prediction is difficult, especially about the future. But I think, personally, over the next several years, bonds should uh, increase their, their rate of return, which is a good thing. That means what? It means that the economy is a whole lot stronger. The demand for money is greater. So the, that means companies are doing well, corporations are doing well, um, individuals are doing well, as state and local governments and the federal government and governments all around the world and companies all around the world. So we should, we should be happy that it happens. But some people are going to be freaked out because we're going to see that rising interest rates is, is dangerous for bonds in the short term. Eh, later, later, later. And then short-term securities, well, again, we could say two to five, but it's better to say one to two these days, folks, because they really aren't paying very much right now. But again, hopefully, as the economy improves and the standard of living rises all around the world, the short-term securities will pay um, better rates of return. We'll see. Now, mutual funds, do you know? No, you can't know because you have to know what the mutual fund invests in. If it's a stock mutual fund, it should follow stocks. If it's a bond mutual fund, bond, bonds, if it's a a money market mutual fund, it should follow the short-term securities. Now, what about hybrid securities? Well, we don't really know about them either. They tend to be in between bonds and stocks because, again, they have the advantages and the disadvantages, So, but not always, not always. They might turn out to be really good investments. They might turn out not to be so good investments. And what about derivatives? Well, let's <laughs> let's just say that I wish you tremendous amount of luck if you start getting involved with these things, folks, because you're going to need it because they're dangerous. Is that enough said? Enough said. Good. Okay. So are you excited? Is it really that hard, this stuff? No. Investing is simple. But it ain't easy. We're going to deal with the emotions later on. But for now, make sure you understand what is on these slides and can, in a few sentences, describe to somebody who has no knowledge whatsoever what a stock is what a bond is, what a mutual fund is. That's all you have to do. You do not have to go into detail. In fact, I wish you won't. I wish you'd just stay in this, this, uh, on, the, on the surface here, looking at it from far away, the overview of the investment alternatives. Because, because when we come back, folks, when we come back into our next presentation, we are going to wrap the entire semester into one presentation. We're going to discuss the relationship, the eternal struggle, the eternal tug of war between risk and return. Do you want to eat well or do you want to sleep well? See you in our next presentation.